Hello, everybody. How's it going? Um, welcome back to another one of our virtual classrooms as uh, we all try and learn as much as we can from home. Um, we're This week, uh, we've been talking all about uh, the Northwest Atlantic White Shark Puzzle in some of our earlier presentations. Um, this one is for grades uh, 7 through 12, um, and we are just super glad to have you all here today. Um, my name is John Keneally. I am OSEARCH's Communications Manager. Uh, joining me today and basically leading the presentation, uh, we have OSEARCH's Education Ambassador, uh, Jennifer Cotton, Jen Cotton. Uh, Jen, how long you've been, how many expeditions have you been on now? Uh, six of them. Six of them. So she's been around for a while, knows her stuff. She's also been a huge part of helping us build out our uh, STEM curriculum so that we can, um, you know, make sure that we are empowering the future uh, ocean stewards. Um, we also have OSEARCH's program manager, Christina Labuglio. She's also a Jacksonville University student. Um, and we have Kyle Bramlett, one of Jen's students. Um, real quick, before uh, we get things started, before I turn it over to Jen to do some deeper introductions, I do want to let you know uh, our presentation today is brought to you thanks to Brooke Kanani Jewelry and Ocean Family Games. For those of you who don't know who Brooke Kanani Jewelry is, she makes wonderful, fantastic uh, ocean-themed jewelry. Something perfect for, say, Mother's Day, which could is not it, not could be, is just around the corner. So definitely check out her work in Ocean Family Games is an excellent way to... Um, play games and save the ocean at the same time. Um, like I said, Jen is pretty much going to be leading the conversation today, but there is a comment section right below the video. So I encourage you all to leave uh, questions if you have them. If they are appropriate, I will interrupt whoever is speaking to ask them right away. In general, I will try to save them for the end. The more on topic your question is, the better chance um, I have of actually being able to ask them. So with that, I will turn it over to you, Jen, um, to kick things off and, and introduce your student and Christina. Perfect. Hi, everybody. Welcome back. Um, and thank you for joining us today to learn all about the North Atlantic White Shark Puzzle. So I'm so excited to have a couple of special people with me this uh, week that I'm so excited for. Um, so Christina is a Jackson University Student. She's actually about to finish her master's degree, so yay, Christina. And she has acted as a mentor for quite a few of my students and helping them and guiding them in some career decisions as well as um, interacting with us when we go up to Jackson University on some field trips. So she has been instrumental in helping me um, kind of guide some of my students um, to some pathways in marine sciences. And then I have Kyle Bramlett with me, who I am so excited to be able to have join me today. Kyle is one of my science research students. Um, he has been to International Science Fair three times. Uh, last year placed third out of the entire um, environmental engineering category. So he is brilliant. He's won best of fair five out of the six um, times that he's competed. So he's going to talk to you guys a lot more about what it means to be a citizen scientist here in a little while. Um, so today we're going to talk all about the Northwest Atlantic White Shark Puzzle um, and learn about, you know, the basics of OSEARCH and why we're doing what we're doing and where we've, where we've started and where we're at now. So we have had 37 expeditions all over the world. Um, some of the more notable ones that you may have been noticing recently is the Northwest Atlantic White Shark Puzzle. So we have been all up and down the Northwest Atlantic. So we have been to Nova Scotia quite a bit recently because that's kind of a big hot spot for us to get um, a lot of the sharks right now. We have done quite a few NASPA expeditions. So if you've been in the Jacksonville, Savannah um, area, you probably have seen us quite a few times out there. Um, we've done New York recently to find those young of the year white sharks, which is one of my favorite ones um, to watch unfold, to see all those little baby white sharks um, being tagged. Um, Christina's tagged quite a few of the sharks that we have tagged recently because she is amazing like that. <laughs> so we've had quite a few expeditions that we've been doing um, in the, no the Northwest Atlantic. So we're still continuing on with that. So you can keep following us with these uh research that we're currently doing. Um, something that is not, I don't 
I don't think it's as well known. And the reason we're doing this talk today is because one of the number one questions I get asked when I go out and do outreach is how do I get involved? Um, John, can you go back to the previous slide, please? So we uh, currently work with 190 scientists all over the world. So it is a huge collaborative effort. And without that collaborative effort, we wouldn't have as much of the information that we have learned and unlocked. So it's really important for us to have scientists from a bunch of different backgrounds reaching out, helping us, doing their own research and being the experts in that field. So we're gonna show you in a little while some of those scientists and the wide range of different research we have going on. We also have worked with people from over 40 different institutions. So there's a whole bunch of different ways that you can get involved. Um, and it's not just directly being a marine scientist. So we're gonna point on, um, hit that point a little bit later too. Uh, so now you can go, sorry, you can go back to the next slide, please. All right, so why is all this work important? Why are we doing all these expeditions and working with so many different people? So looking at the history of the white shark, um, you know, they sharks have been around for over 400 million years and we're just now learning about everything about them. You know, there's so much that we just don't know. Um, so this puzzle is really just something that's going to take quite a bit of time. Um, and <clears throat> with that, we are going beyond just where they're located. So you can see on the tracker, like, oh, here's where Mary Lee is, here's where Lydia was, here's where Ironbound's heading. So you can kind of follow them around, but there's actually a whole lot more that goes on beyond just the tracker. Um, it's gonna focus also on population health and physiology of the sharks. Um, and then solving this is going to help us to really understand more about the ocean and how to keep the ocean healthy and, and lead it towards abundance. So white sharks are indicator species. They kind of manage all of the ocean. Um, you know, Chris always says like the wolves of Yellowstone, how they're the top predator and they're, they're keeping everything else balanced. So if we lose sharks, we literally lose the ocean. So they keep everything under control. Uh, so we have to make sure that white sharks um, are managed uh, so that we can keep that balance in check. Go ahead, John. So with that, um, and because this work is so important, OSEARCH has taken the lead on open sourcing data. So, you know, as a scientist, data is the most important thing that you can work with. So without that, you don't really have anything to come to conclusions with and to make new discoveries. So it's very important for us to open source the data and allow anyone to use it. Um, anyone from, you know, little tiny kids all the way up to, you know, PhD working in the field. So everybody is, has open access to that. And anybody who, you know, is doing research can reach out and, and see what we're doing so that we can help each other. Um, we've also, with that, have created all of this education curriculum to make it available in the classrooms and to help empower teachers to bring OSEARCH into their classrooms and make sharks obtainable for everyone to learn. You know, I'm in Florida, so it's really easy for me to talk about the ocean, but someone landlocked, you know, in the middle of the United States, it's a little bit more difficult. So this is a way for us to open source all of that and create curriculum so that everyone can learn all about sharks. So with that, we're going to talk about some of the projects that are currently going on. Uh, we've highlighted quite a few of our scientists. Um, so the first one we'll discuss is Lisa Hoops, and her main focus is she's actually looking at the nutrition of the great whites. So they take samples and she looks at what they're eating and how that relates to their health. Then we have uh, Giselle uh, Montano, and she is working on reproduction. So we're looking at all this, uh, the reproduction system of the sharks to understand a little bit more about that whole process. We have Brian Franks, which is looking at the movement of the sharks. Uh, so where are they going? How are they moving? You know, that's his main goal. Harley Newton, I love Harley's work. It's so interesting. She looks at health assessments and stress, and she does a lot of work with their blood, which hearing her speak about blood of sharks, you're like, I don't even know how she came up with all that. Like, she's brilliant, and it's really interesting to hear her talk. Then we have Lisa Crawford, who we're actually going to have on here um, soon, talking about toxicology. So she'll take samples from the sharks uh, to look at different levels of toxins in their bodies. 
um, like methyl mercury. So looking at mercury levels within the sharks. We also have Kim Ritchie, who, if you were here with us last week, she looks at beneficial microbes. So she's looking at the microbial community on the sharks to see, you know, what's growing on them in different parts of their bodies. You got a question, Jen? When you're done. Oh, okay. So she's looking at all different aspects of their body. So their teeth, their caudal fin, which is their tail, their dorsal side, you know, she's going through and taking swabs of all those areas. And she's seeing um, what kind of microbes live there. And they are actually able to work towards creating antibiotics and different medications. Go ahead, Jeff. So as we talk about the white shark puzzle, um, as, as you've introduced, you've introduced a lot of um, the the uh, work being done by some of our collaborating scientists. Um, a couple of people have asked down in the comments, um, and either you can take this, Jen, or Christina, either one of you, I think, could be a good person to answer this. How many sharks have we tagged so far, and, and how hard is it to do this? Christina, do you maybe want to take this yeah, one? Yeah, i Christina do that, since she's tagged quite a few of them, so she can talk about that process. Christina is on the platform. She's also part of our science team, so she's on the platform helping all the scientists uh, do their work. She's sort of their extra set of hands for anything that anybody needs. So she's definitely the good go-to person for this. Yeah. So uh, um, on the tracker right now, there's uh, currently uh, over 200 um, sharks on the tracker. But as a uh, part of the Northwest Atlantic uh, white shark puzzle, there are 58 white sharks um, in the sample size currently for this project, and that includes the young of the year. That includes the the sub adults and the, all the adult sharks that we've taken from uh, that from that we've taken samples from uh, from Nantucket in Nova Scotia and in the Nassau area. Um, what was the second part of the question, John? How how hard is it to tag a shark? Um, to actually tag the shark, once the shark is on the lift, it's really not that hard. Um, our fishing team works uh, uh, very hard in order to get the animal to us. They're out there um, starting at sundown and they don't stop fishing at sun up and they don't stop fishing until sundown. So they're out there all day uh, working very hard to get these sharks for us. And once the shark is actually on the lift, though, uh, we take about 15 minutes to do the entire workup. So there's typically 19 to 20 projects going on at one time. Um, and it's it's really not that hard when we when we mount the tag onto the shark's fin. It it feels like uh, we are getting our ears pierced or something. Um, and that actual process of tagging the shark uh, uh, only takes uh, a few minutes to actually do. There is another question here that had to do with all of these different scientists that we see on the screen right now. Um, are they working together or are they doing their own thing? So everything on the lift is a huge collaborative effort. So like I said, we have 19 to 20 different projects going on at one time. These are some of the scientists that we do collaborate with. Um, and depending on the science team that is there on the lift, which usually consists of about five to six team members, um, we'll break up uh, what samples need to be taken uh, uh, to each person. and. Let's say I'm on the lift and I could be take, helping Lisa take the muscle sample and I could be taking some parasite samples. And at the same time, Giselle is out there taking her ultrasound. And if uh, something needs to get done and someone doesn't have time to do it because they are tied up with something, another sample that they're taking, someone will always step in to, to help out. So it's a huge collaborative effort on and off the lift. Um, all right, so we're going to talk a little bit about um, educate, inspire, enable. So if you visit our website or have purchased some of our items, you may have seen this before. Um, this is kind of what OSEARCH is, is founded upon. So the goal is for us to educate about great whites and just sharks in general. Um, and we are branching out to a bunch of different areas. So it's really just the ocean as a whole. Um, and the whole point is to educate um, because education is so important when it comes 
to maintaining the ocean and uh, conservation side of marine sciences. So, you know, kids love great white sharks just like they love dinosaurs. So it's very easy for us to go into classrooms and get kids so excited about the work that we're doing when we talk about, you know, the, the sharks and bring it in a STEM curriculum that's um, available to them to actually do work along with us. And hopefully that will inspire the next generation of scientists like Kyle, who's coming up here next, to you know move on in their lives and go to you know, university in order to pursue careers in marine sciences or other avenues that can bring them towards marine sciences. Um, and then enable. So we enable scientists to come on board and do their research in a way that they weren't possibly able to do before. So they have access to the sharks in a big way, having them on the lift. Um, so getting those blood samples and ultrasounds on a great white shark is not something you can do um, on a regular basis in the way that we've enabled people to be able to do it. So um, with that, we're going to have Kyle come on and he's going to kind of talk to you about his path towards his future career goals, which he'll tell you a little bit about here in a second. Real quick, guys, I do see some of your questions coming in. Kate and Claire, for example, you guys have some great questions. I'll get to those at the end. So. Uh, stand by. In the meantime, I know a lot of a lot of. Correct me if I'm wrong, uh, Jen, but Kyle is here because one of the questions that you get on a very regular basis is, we see all of these awesome that you know all the awesome work being done on the white shark puzzle, and I think a lot of people want to be a part of that. Yeah. And so a question that you get a lot of the time is, well, you know, I want to I want to help solve that puzzle. So that's why you brought Kyle, is that right? So that we can sort of learn a little bit about what it takes to, to get on a career path to, to you know get a job with OSEARCH or one of our collaborating scientists. Yeah, so every, every single time I do some kind of outreach, I get asked, how do I get involved? Uh, we get emailed uh, at least once a week asking how to get involved. Um, every social media post, someone is asking how they can help. So um, I brought Kyle along because, you know, he's a high school student who has, has really worked his way up and networked to get to the level that he's at. So he's reached out to many different people at universities. You know, we, we've we collaborated with uh, Jackson University asking them for some mentoring. Um, he's worked with people at Florida Institute of Technology. And the reason why he has really gone so far as a such a young kid is because he is um, very open to talk to people, um, and he's very good at networking. On top of, you know, a little smart, right? You know, he's been to International Science Fair many times. Um, and you can see, actually, and I'm not going to take his slide over, but the picture there in the middle, that's him on the OSEARCH. Um, he impressed me so much as a research student that I actually invited him out to come on the OSEARCH with me. So he's been on expedition um, as, a high, as a junior in high school, so he wasn't even a senior yet. Um, so with that, we'll go ahead and let Kyle, talk about his pathway and how you can get involved at a younger age since we are hitting on the secondary level of high school right now. And these are things that you can currently do right this minute. Well, thank you. And first off, I'd just like to thank you guys for having me today and giving me this opportunity to come on here and share with the audience kind of not only my experiences in the field of science and how I've got to the level I'm at today, but also uh, kind of the avenue I've took to get in a position to not only um, have the, you know, been blessed to go on a couple expeditions with OSEARCH, but as well, um, you know, be going off to university and have given some of the opportunities that I've gotten. And first off, um, you know, so now currently, like uh, Jim Cotton was saying, I'm a senior in high school. And for the past six years now, I've kind of uh, been working um, in the science field and science research field and just getting more and more involved. And initially, you know, at a young age, and I think this is probably true for a lot of people throughout the nation right now, uh, you know, in that elementary slash early middle school age, a lot of people are required to do these science research projects. You know, it's one of those things that a lot of people do, you know, baking soda volcanoes, things like that. And for me, it was very similar. You know, we're first introduced to this kind of whole field of science, if you will. And one of the biggest things for me when I was younger, uh, when I was first introduced to kind of science as a whole is, uh, or at least what I would think of as astronauts or rockets or things like that, or a lab setting. And it kind of seems like this huge, you know, monstrous thing that's kind of out of your reach. But what I began to figure out is science encompasses so much. The, the field of science is so big and not only the field of science, but the way of thinking that it teaches you and the whole scientific process. And it is exactly that. It's a process. It kind of has taught me to analyze certain situations differently. And I think that as a whole is kind of what's led me to uh, some of the things so far that I've accomplished. 
So early on doing these projects, the biggest thing that um, I would like to tell you guys is find something you're passionate about. And for me, that's been the marine sciences. Obviously, O-Search with the whole shark tagging and me personally, I've done a lot of research, not only on sharks, but as well as oyster restoration and coral reef restoration. So early on, I found that passion for the marine environment. And from there, I just really you know, took off with it and started my own research. And from that began um, investigating my own things as far as oyster restoration. So I took that and early on in middle school, just started off relatively simple as far as studying oysters habits and just the, uh, you know, the entire marine ecosystem of intertidal areas. And from there going on into high school, I furthered that research. And the biggest thing that I found was through this science research and through the whole um, career field of science, I was able to get contacts such as, you know, O-Search is a very big one, especially with um, one of my biggest mentors, uh, Ms. Jennifer Cotton. Um, through science research, it's kind of provided me with a lot of avenues that have led me not only to getting to go on these uh, O-Search expeditions, but as well as getting to uh, go on into college. Of course, I'm a senior now, so I'll be going on into college next year. So it's provided me with a lot of different avenues as far as scholarships goes and as far as talking with different uh, researchers and professors at other universities that have provided aid to me as far as um, mentoring me in my studies, which have allowed me to get to a position today where though I'm only a senior in high school, I'm pursuing uh, publishing my current study and hopefully uh, within the next couple of years as I pursue uh, not only um, a PhD in environmental engineering, but hopefully marine biology, I'd love to patent my work. Um, so the biggest thing is uh, just getting out there and finding what you're passionate about. And of course, once you find that, uh, just reach out to people, you know, never be afraid to talk and never be afraid um, to kind of dig in there. And from that, that's how I've got my contacts. And so if we want to kind of move on to the next slide there. Uh, so like I was saying, oh, Go back just one minute. There we go. Um, so like I was saying, the, the science research going on into high school, I just furthered my research and kept reaching out to people. And from that, just kept building upon my knowledge. And that's what's led me to now, you know, being a senior, getting these opportunities, like I was telling you guys about, like these scholarships and opportunities to go on to O-Search. And that's the biggest thing um, as far as one of the questions that was just asked before I started talking, how to get involved. Um, not only um, probably with O-Search, but just in general with um, organizations that are doing similar things to this. And that really is the biggest thing is get involved, not only early on, but you know it's never too late to get involved and find something you're passionate about and just keep working towards that, keep reaching out to people. And you know that's the biggest thing. And eventually it will lead to um, whether it's an opportunity to work with a wonderful organization such as O-Search or an opportunity to meet with a professor and expand your knowledge and have them work with you as a mentor. Uh, me personally, um, like I was saying, I'm at a position where I would love to pursue my research and pursue a, pub, uh, not only publish my research, but as well as pursue a patent. Um, but I am now pursuing a career in environmental engineering and marine biology. And all of this stemmed from, you know, early on, like I was saying in that early middle school to elementary school years, finding that passion for science and realizing that science doesn't have to be, you know, you don't have to go out there and create a cure for cancer, or, you know, do something like that. And you can really pursue anything you're passionate about. And as long as you give your all and you're pursuing it and you're passionate about it, it doesn't have to be another school assignment. You know, it can be something you truly enjoy and it can be something that will, you know, hopefully eventually turn into a career that you love and enjoy. Kyle, quick question some people have asked. Um, do you have to live by the water in order to, you know, get involved with something like this? Not at all. So that is a great question. And um, that's actually one that I've been asked quite a bit. Um, Ms. Uh, Jennifer Cotton was saying that I've competed in a couple international science fairs. And of course, that's people from all around the world. And, you know, more so specifically uh, from the United States, I get a lot of people talking to me, you know, from states that are more inland and further away from the ocean. Obviously, me being in Florida, it, it's a little easier for me to be around the ocean and the marine environment and to, um, you know, be passionate about stuff like this. But by no means do you have to be, um, you know, live on the ocean or near the marine environment to get involved with things like this. There are, you know, plenty of wonderful opportunities to do research in a lab setting or in a home setting and just research in general um, without having to be or have access to the ocean environment. And from that... The biggest thing is to just start networking with people, you know, send emails uh, to professors in the fields that you're interested in. For me specifically, if I was a student living somewhere that was further away um, from the marine environment or specifically in Florida where I am, 
just reach out to those people um, who possibly have access to that data or the knowledge that you're seeking as far as what study you're pursuing um, to gain access to those opportunities or mentorships. And from there, you can then pursue whether it's a, it's a field in a, a career in marine biology or a career in another, um, we'll say marine, you know, kind of situation where you might not have access to, but by reaching out, you know, you're still getting your name out there and you're still exposing yourself to those same resources that someone, let's say, such as me in Florida or another coastal state would have. Um, to add to what he was saying really quick, so Kyle's work started with him filtering water in a couple of tanks to see how um, bivalves, you know, function in that manner. And it has grown to creating structures where he uh, was helping to promote oyster recruitment out in the field. So he was in the, in the local waters here. But his work this year was done you know, primarily in my classroom as a controlled experiment, um, looking at how his structure could help combat ocean acidification. So he had four controlled tanks with simulated seawater that he manipulated within the classroom. So if your teachers don't have that ability, like he was saying, you can reach out to universities. Many of them are very excited to help high school students work towards careers like this. So if you have something big you wanna do that's ocean related, Look at what your local universities or community colleges have available to you, and you should be able to um, get into their labs as well. But again, it's all about networking and making sure that you ask. No, exactly. Um, like Ms. Jennifer Cotton just said, uh, especially this year, one of the biggest things I incorporated into my research was the lab testing component. Uh, for the past, you know, my research project has spanned over a course of six years, primarily testing in the field where I'm in Florida. However, one of the really things I realized this year is the lab testing was a huge component of it. And I was able to find or gather, you know, a lot of valuable data through that lab testing. And that's one of those things where it doesn't matter if you're, you know, five miles from the ocean or 500 miles from the ocean through reaching, reaching out and collaborating with whether it's the universities or other professionals in the field and kind of gathering an idea on what you want to do or, you know, how you want to expand this research or expand your, um, your knowledge of the scientific field and do these uh, sorts of projects, lab testing is a great way to do it. And, you know, like uh, Ms. Jennifer Cotton was saying early on in my middle school years, it was very simple. I had a, a couple 10 gallon aquariums I set up and I was measuring the filtration ability of oysters and clams. Very simple, you know, very economically affordable. However, I was still, you know, observing a, a very unique scientific um, process and I was, you know, gathering that knowledge and kind of starting off that basis of my knowledge, which has led me to where I am today without even having to be in the field. And then, um, so one of the things um, that I can kind of expand on a little bit more as far as um, those who may be interested in how do you become a scientist or, um, you know, how uh, to get involved in these certain things, which is kind of one of the biggest topics that we've been focusing on specifically, you know, how to get involved in organizations such as OSEARCH is find what you're passionate in. Obviously right now I'm talking about the marine sciences and how to get involved in those career paths. Uh, that's what's specific to me. But overall, you need to find what you're passionate about and pick something that um, you can pursue and not kind of view it as something as, you know, oh, it's another homework assignment or, oh, it's a chore, but find something that you enjoy and that you're passionate about and then pursue those internships and volunteer opportunities you know, for, for me, where I've pursued opportunities to volunteer with different shark tagging programs, uh, such as OSEARCH, as well as different volunteer programs local to me, uh, restoration programs, and just getting exposed to a lot of knowledge. And from that, it kind of uh, fills your mind with what you may be interested in. And from there, you gather uh, the thoughts you need to kind of go and formulate what university you may want to pursue in the future to further pursue the career options and from there, hopefully become involved in the marine sciences field. For me, I've actually uh, just committed to UCF to pursue uh, environmental engineering and marine sciences, and hopefully beyond that, pursue PhDs in both marine biology and environmental engineering to hopefully continue the research that I've done as far as coastal restoration, specifically of coral reefs and other calcifying organisms. But all of that has stemmed from finding what I was passionate about and just pursuing it and reaching out and seeking out those volunteer and internship opportunities. So, um, yeah. Ms. Jennifer Cotton or Christina, if you want to go ahead and take over. Um, yeah, I'm going to expand on that a little bit. Um, 
So like Kyle said, uh, you want to find what you're passionate about. But if uh, you recall from earlier uh, from the presentation, you know, we talked about it, um, Harley Newton, who studies the health assessment and uh, the stress physiology of the sharks, but she's actually a vet. Um, so her background is in veterinary science sciences. And you have uh, um, Lisa Crawford, who does the toxicology studies. Um, her background is in chemistry. Uh, my background is actually a more physical component. Um, my master's thesis is actually physics based and the movement of water. So to uh, be in the field, you don't have to be exactly marine scientists, marine sciences. You can go into biology. You can have a mathematical degree. Kyle is going into environmental engineering. Um, you can go into physics. You can become a vet and get into this type of research. So there's so many options available for all of you to get into career options, uh, what, like being a shark biologist. Um, and so you just have to pick the right university that's for you. Don't forget about all the other subjects. Don't forget about math or chemistry, physics, engineering. Um, and when it comes to volunteering and internships, you just have to put yourself out there um, that, and that's ultimately how I got my job and how I got my previous job before this. You put yourself out there um, and, and you do what's needed uh, needed of you. And a lot of times that's through volunteering and, and through an internship. Christina, a lot of people are asking in the comments, and you, you touched on it, but I, I'm curious if you could go just a little bit more. What is math important? Is, um, like you said, physics important? Are all of these other like Lily is asking, do you have to be good at math? Are all of the other subjects important if you want to be, um, you know, in a career similar to, to yours? Um, I just, math is important. You don't have to be good at it right now in high school or something. Everybody is always so afraid of math. Um, but you're going to use it. And I promise you, I used Y equals MX plus B the other day for my thesis. So when you're learning it in your math class, you use it again, promise. Um, Matt, everything is important when it comes to the physics, when uh, you see that the sharks are following a, a sea surface temperature and they're following the sea surface temperature of maybe the Gulf Stream going uh, up, uh, the going north uh, uh, up the east coast of the US, that right there is physics. When you see that the sharks are following the eddies and they're diving in the eddies, that right there is physics. Um, when you want to know how pollution or let's say climate change can be affecting the movements of the sharks, that right there is chemistry. So everything ties in together. So all of the subjects are important but you don't have, in order to get a career as a shark scientist, um, you don't have to stick strictly to biology. If you're passionate about biology or a field within biology, then go for it. Our, our collaborator, Giselle, she is a reproductive biologist. Um, so that, that comes in. So all the subjects come in together at some point so that we can all collaborate to really figure out the puzzle of the white sharks. So every subject matters. So I can, um, sorry, I can add to that a little bit too with me being like good at math. I was terrible at math in high school um, and in you know university, chemistry wasn't my favorite, but now that it is more in an application setting to where I'm using it for a purpose like looking at water chemistry and how it's interacting that's actually some of my favorite things to discuss now are climate change and ocean acidification and those are both chem heavy chemistry based um, topics so don't let it scare you because you hear that there's math involved it's a it's a lot more of an application versus just you know working through a ton of different formulas you're actually applying it to a purpose and it makes it a lot more obtainable and and gives a reason behind it um, it gives you that why. Um, so I actually ended up, like I said, enjoying chemistry much more than I ever thought I ever would enjoy it. So don't let those uh, topics scare you um, because, like I said, you are applying it to something that you're interested in. Real quick, um, 
maybe Kyle, you can possibly answer this one. Or Christina, you can chime in too. Um, a lot of people ask, do I need a marine biology degree to be a shark scientist? And I've heard, like, for example, Dr. Kim Ritchie last year when we were talking about it, she said, no, she does not have a degree in marine biology, but yet she works with sharks. I forget exactly what her degree is. But you're getting two degrees, marine biology and environmental engineering. Why, why pick two? Um, so for me specifically, one of the, the biggest reasons why I wanted to pursue both uh, marine biology and environmental engineering, uh, of course, recently my studies have been focused be, um, around engineering and artificial structure as far as designing uh, these improved methods of not only oyster restoration, but the restoration of calcifying organisms. And I'm applying a lot of engineering principles to that. Uh, so that's kind of incorporating the environmental um, kind of ocean engineering um, concepts into that research. But as far as the reason I wanted to pursue marine biology as well is to incorporate um, the, the valuable information I'm learning from marine biology as far as how these organisms are interacting in the marine environment, what as far as um, the, the water quality parameters, what calcium levels are they needing, you know, what type of environment do these organisms need to be living in. And, um, and from that, from finding out that, you know, pursuing marine biology, finding out how these organisms are, are living in the marine environment, where they are, um, what they need as far as to survive and to, um, you know, be plentiful, um, taking that data and then incorporating it into, okay, so now this is how I need to engineer, um, whether it's the artificial structures I'm working on now or any projects um, that I'm hopefully pursuing or, you know, you know, research projects in the future, taking that information um, as far as the marine environment as a whole and then incorporating that um, into it to hopefully try and design um, the best possible method um, specifically right now for the restoration of calcifying organisms to improve water quality uh, due to ocean acidification. So to raise those pH levels, raise those calcium levels for calcifying organisms such as corals and shellfish. So it's kind of incorporating the principles of both uh, to have hopefully the best possible outcome. I'm going to add on to that. Um, John, like you said, you know, Dr. Kim Ritchie uh, doesn't have a marine science background. Dr. Kim Ritchie has a background in genetics. Um, like I said earlier, um, Dr. Harley Newton, she actually has a background in veterinary sciences. So she it works as, as a vet and she is able to do research with sharks. So there are multiple career options that you can take in order to be able to work with sharks. Okay, um, and I can add that too as well because I'm a teacher and I get to work with sharks. I go shark tagging a couple times a year with different organizations, so you can do it as a teacher too. <laughs> um, so what we've done so to get you started, if you're interested in trying to start pursuing science research or coming up with you know exploring the world of science, um, and like we said a lot is to find that passion. So we've come up with a way for you uh, to become a citizen scientist and to join us in doing some research. So we gave you um, a specific way that you can accomplish this along with some definitions to help you along the way. So the first thing you know, scientists do is we make observations and we ask questions. So if there's anything you've noticed or that you've experienced you know, and observed, that's where questions come from in science. So come up with your scientific question. Then you're going to formulate a hypothesis. So a lot of times, you know, people will teach you, right, if this happens, then this would happen. It's more of a stating a claim um, and providing evidence for why you think this might be an answer to your scientific question. So it's going to go a little bit bigger than just if this happens, then this happens. Um, so again, I forgot to say, just like last week, um, if you would like, go ahead and take a picture of this screen and then you can do that. Actually, the next two screens will give you information on this. And this is so you can refer back to it if you want to take part and share your citizen scientist projects with us. So in the experimental design process, you come up with a rationale, you know, explaining um, why this is important and how you might, you know, uh, answer your scientific question. Then you need to come up with procedures, which is a step by step procedure to test your question. So remember that experiments should be replicable. So try and have somebody read those to see if your steps are easy to follow. Uh, we do this in my science research class repeatedly over a few weeks to make sure that they are top-notched in order to, you know, get us all to International Science Fair. But 
For now, just make sure that somebody else is able to follow your steps. And if you are to pursue this a little bit later on, this is something that you can really work on. And um, again, I would be happy to help you with that as well. So you can email that education at osearch.org email. Um, if you ever, if you are really um, interested in this and want some mentoring on it, I am definitely available to help with that. Your materials, what are you going to be using? Make sure you provide, oh, another good procedure is make sure you provide measurements. So don't just say grab water, say like grab 50 milliliters of water. Um, if you don't have um, specific science tools at home, you can just say half of a cup. You know, a lot of people have measuring cups, so you can, or a tablespoon, teaspoon, you know, you can get creative with your measurements while you're at home. Um, independent variables and dependent variables, as well as your control, are things that I know every single science class really pushes. In fact, my AP environmental science class has to create an experimental design for one of their test questions. And we still push independent variable and dependent variable all the time because it's difficult um, sometimes for students. So we want to make sure that we're doing this correctly. Um, so an independent variable is one that you are manipulating or changing. So how I teach my kids, it's I, there's an I in it. So I control the independent variable. This is what I'm going to be changing. Um, dependent variable is the measurable value. So this is what responds to your independent variable. So if you're going to change pH levels in a tank using um, an acidic solution, you know, your independent variable is going to be the acidic solution and your dependent variable is going to be that pH level. Controls, which one are going to remain the same? So that would be a tank that doesn't have any of the acid, it'd be just normal conditions. So next slide, please. And then the importance of being data centric. So part of OSEARCH's goal by providing all of this data is to create data centric individuals. So we have all of our data open source so that you become data minded. Um, this is the goal of science. You know, we want to collect data so that we can formulate conclusions um, and hopefully expand on our knowledge in science. So your data collection plan, here's some basics that you can do. Um, what are you intending on collecting? How often do you plan to collect? Like in Kyle's project, he went out um, into the field once a week and then the lab, we did five day trials. Um, where is your data gonna go? And after your data is collected, how are you gonna analyze it? So once you have all of that information, what are you gonna do with it? What is it telling you? And another thing to note that doing one trial isn't enough. Um, in science, there's multiple, multiple trials. Um, we did 14, was it 14 or 16, something like that, weeks for Kyle's project. It was many, 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 many weeks of, of data tracking. Same thing with the, the white shark puzzle. You know, if we're looking at sea surface temperatures and how they interact with it, we're not just going to look at one season. Um, our sharks tags have about a five year battery life on them. So we hopefully get five years worth of data to give us, you know, some very specific patterns that we can research and look at. Um, people aren't just taking one blood sample or taking multiple blood samples from many different types of sharks at different stages in their life, as well as male versus female, um, different locations. Um, Kim was telling us last week that, you know, some of the swabs from up north are a lot different than the swabs down here because the microbes on the sharks vary depending on where they're located. So data is so important in science. So make sure that whatever you're doing, you're collecting a lot of data so that you can analyze it to come up with some really great conclusions. All right, so with that, I guess we'll have some questions available. Sorry, I was on mute. Thank you guys all for that. I've been looking at some of your questions here. And one of the questions, this is off topic, but I was curious too. People in the comments started talking about bull sharks. Christina, why can bull sharks go in freshwater and other sharks can't? Do you? I don't know the answer to that question. Do you? Not off the top of my head. I do not. So there you go. You guys stumped us. So thank you. Unless Jim. Kyle, Kyle, you got to answer. You know, I know you know. I, I actually, that is one I as well do not know off the top of my head. I know that generally the bull sharks come into more estuarian or more brackish waters to have their young. Um, however, I don't know scientifically as far as what in them enables them to go in those more freshwater environments off the top of my head. But that is a very good question. Um, I know the answer again off the top of my head, but I know it has something to do with the way that they regulate salt through their body. Um, I want to say it's their kidneys that allow them to flush it out, but it's something that I'd have to double check um, into. But I want to say it's something 
it's the way that they regulate the salt. Um, but I can't remember exact specifics. So thank you all for stumping us and making us look really good. I appreciate that one. Um, but going back to a more sort of on topic question, this one was asked towards the beginning of the presentation. Um, do you know, all we were talking about all of the different scientists and all the different projects. The question was, do we practice before we go onto the lift? How do we know what we do before we get, or you know, when we're actually there? Is it, do we practice? Um, I wouldn't call it exactly practice, um, but when we, uh, when a, a new scientist comes on board, um, anytime we have a science team swap out, um, every morning we have a science team meeting. And during that meeting, the chief scientist of the expedition um, goes through and assigns tasks to the rest of the science team. Um, and uh, you do the tasks that you are most comfortable with. Um, so if I were to be assigned a task, I would be assigned taking uh, the bacterial swabs for Dr. Ritchie um, or taking the muscle biopsy for Lisa Crawford um, or taking the fecal samples um, because that is what I am most comfortable and most trained in doing. Um, so every morning we have a meeting like that, and I guess you can call that sort of our practice round. Um, and every morning we make sure we go out on the lift. We have uh, little packs with us that have all the equipment that we need in order to take a sample. And if we need to preserve the sample immediately, we have all of that equipment with us on the lift. So every morning we make sure right after the science meeting that our packs are ready to go with everything. Um, and yeah, so that, that would be sort of our practice round. So I guess you can say every morning we have a practice round. Another question was, how long is, is the process? Um, the process of taking all of the samples uh, uh, takes roughly about 15 minutes. Um, uh, so you have five to six scientists that are going out taking these 20 uh, samples for these projects. Uh, um, and it all happens within 15 minutes. Now those 15 minutes though, feels like two seconds. So it's a, it's a pretty short period of time when you think about the amount of stuff that we are doing. Uh, moving on a little bit later, some people uh, asked, you know, do we have necessarily a recommended university? Obviously, Jacksonville University is our um, sort of the academic home of OSEARCH. They are um, our academic partner, and they definitely have a great um, program. Christina, do you want to mention anything about Jacksonville University or, you know, just picking a university in general to help put you on the right path? Yeah, so... I did my undergrad at Jacksonville University and I'm finishing up my graduate degree there as well. Um, so obviously I liked it. Um, <laughs> but it's important that you pick the university that is right for you. So when I was choosing a university, I knew that I would not excel in a classroom that had more than 100 students in it. I needed a small classroom. Um, so that narrowed down my search so that all of my universities that I was looking for were on the smaller end. I was looking at universities that had a total amount of students of maybe 4,000. Um, so I needed a small university and I needed that for my own personal needs for education and excelling in my career. Um, so that when you're choosing your university, you need to consider that as well. Does it have the program that you wanna go into? Um, uh, is it going to give you opportunities that you want? Study abroad opportunities, internship opportunities, or volunteer opportunities. But is it also going to be a program that you see yourself excelling in? Sorry, I was I was on mute. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so I guess the 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 last question I'll ask because we're butting right up against our time. If um, you guys could have, you know, offer one piece of advice in like 15 seconds or less, each of you, all three of you, 20 seconds or less, what piece of advice would that be to help somebody get uh, to where you are right now, you know, studying sharks? 
I guess I'll start since I'm on top here. Um, what I tell my students is to make yourself marketable. So what are you doing that's going to make you stand out from somebody else that's doing the same exact things that you're doing? You know, yes, GPA is really important, but there's also thousands of kids who have the same GPA as you. So what makes you stand out? So you see one of my students on here and you don't see all of my students on here. And it's because he's put himself out there and really shown that he he's not only smart, he actually cares very much about all of this. And for me, that's really important, knowing that he will go on to pursue this as a career to help try and change the world. So as an educator and someone in a position like I am working with OSearch, I brought a few different students on and they all had that same thing in common. They had they work really hard and hustle. They have demonstrated that they have passion behind what they're doing and that they ultimately care and that they would like to try and pursue something like this in the future. So. A lot of it, you're going to be working for free and you're going to be networking and volunteering at events and maybe getting, you know, Kyle helped in some of the bait buckets, you know, so you might get a little dirty, but you're putting yourself out there and showing that you have really good work ethic and drive to pursue and move yourself forward. Um, my quick piece of advice is to uh, volunteer as much as possible. Um, you know, internships may be hard to get, but it's not hard to go out and volunteer and to give your free time for something that you're passionate about. And it pays off in the end, I promise you. I would have to definitely, um, you know, my piece of advice would agree with Christina, find something you're passionate about. And once you figure out what that is and what you want to pursue, you know, just find volunteer opportunities, find, you know, internship opportunities and put your name out there. Uh, you have to get out there and, you know, like uh, Jennifer Cotton was saying, there's a lot of people out there um, who are going to have the same, especially, you know, in a high school setting, once you're going on to that university setting, a lot of people are going to have the same GPA as you and probably going to be wanting some of the similar things that you want. What is going to make you stand out from, you know, the other 10,000 kids out there that are going for the same positions that you are? And what that is, is going to be your volunteer you know, your volunteer hours, your internship opportunities, how much you put yourself out there and reached out to those contacts, to those professors um, and trying to pursue, you know, what you're passionate about. So that would be my one bit of, uh, piece of advice. And then, of course, I, um, a lot of people are asking about internship opportunities at OSEARCH and volunteer opportunities at OSEARCH. Um, it's not, we do take volunteers um, on certain basis. Um, like Jen Cotton is actually a, a, a volunteer um, with OSEARCH. Opportunities vary a lot. Um, it's We don't often take volunteers out on expedition because the ship has to be sort of maintained for the scientists to make sure we have all of the scientists on board. But anytime we do have uh, volunteer opportunities out, we post about them on our social media channels, all of our social media channels. If we're looking for help, say with education, or sometimes we're looking for help um, writing, or sometimes we're help looking for help sort of setting up an event, we always post about those on our social media channels. So definitely keep an eye out um, there. Um, and internships, um, what my advice would be, you know, OSEARCH works with all of these different organizations from Mo Marine Laboratory to the Wildlife Conservation Society, um, Jacksonville University, all, all of these institutions, um, and while OSEARCH right now, we don't have an internship program set up, all of these institutions that we work with do, so there potentially could be a way there um, to, to get aboard. In the meantime, we always invite people to come say hello, join, uh, jump on the ship with us. If you see it in port, you know, walk up to the, uh, walk up to the side of the ship and flag somebody down and say, hey, I'm, I'm curious about it. Um, we open up the ship to tours whenever we are uh, going out on expedition, both before and after. So those are, uh, those are opportunities to come out and introduce yourself. Um, and then obviously, if you have a great idea, we're always open to great ideas. Shoot us an email, um, education at osearch.org. Let us know, hey, this is what I'm thinking. And if you guys have a great idea, hey, maybe that's a way to get involved too. So um, with that, I want to thank everybody who came, uh, who joined us here today. Um, uh, we have, many of you know, been doing these presentations on Tuesdays and Thursdays uh, with our education ambassadors. Um, we will continue to do those for the next couple of weeks. Uh, so please 
Uh, stay tuned for more, and we look forward to seeing you all next time. Jen, Christina, Kyle, thank you guys so much. Uh, Brooke Kanani Jewelry, Ocean Family Games, thank you guys so much. Um, and I guess with that, we will uh, we will sign off. <laughs>